And are there any members of the public there? There are three members of the public. Wonderful. And as always, it's always a good moment to change some lives. So let's get started. <laughs> this meeting is being recorded and or transcribed. Episode of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board Subcommittee for Social Equity. It's the 21st of October. The meeting is now called to order. Um, so let's take attendance. So for the for the subcommittee, Nader Hashim. Present. Ashley Reynolds. Present. Julio Thompson. Here. Sonata Davis. Present. And Gina Cranwinkle. Present. Uh, John O'Donnell. Present. I'm and for uh, the board. Can you tell us who's there and who's in the room? Uh, just me from the board. And then three Excellent. members of the public. All right, welcome, welcome to this episode. Um, for the next step, we'd like to approve the mi minutes of our last meeting. Um, so may I have a motion to approve the minutes, please? I'll make that motion. Oh, I'll second. All right, moved and seconded. Minutes have been approved. All right, our next step, so uh, we want to first of all thank members of the uh, Vermont Citizenry for submitting some uh, public comments. Here, we got a couple this week. Uh, so here's the first summarized one from Ben Mervis. Suggest that the subcommittee includes social consumption in their discussion for special licenses and social equity exclusivity. People need a safe place to consume cannabis and some people are not able to consume at their homes or assisted living slash long-term care facilities. Without a private space where consumption is permitted, they are forced to break one rule or another. Social consumption provides a space and opportunity for consumers, particularly first-time consumers, to learn about and experience products. Rules and regulations can be created that safeguard public health and safety, such as designated driver, to join the group experience, or for that same use, to use a ride-sharing service. Other states allow for social consumption, which we can use as examples. We, my friend and business partner, Greg Mitchell, Believe consumption lounges will only benefit the state in creating a successful cannabis industry. Our next one is from Francis Wyatt, and Francis says, I wholeheartedly support the recommendation to the CCB of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. This is a 31 page comment we received at the last session. Um, I would like to see the majority of the cannabis cultivation in Vermont be outdoor grown, small scale, and truly Vermont based. Please create a system that prevents large corporations from dominating Vermont cannabis market. Thank you, Francis, for that comment. And next, from Stephen Radcliffe. Stephen, I feel the setup structure for whom is eligible slash able to start a small grow is rigged. The fee structure makes fee high if overlap given the alleged social mm -hmm. equity. Small home growers, social equity growers, could meet this demand. All of the questions being answered and covered as major topics or general topics, although rightly major within themselves, such as issues as age, use, location, etc., etc. The major issues are who, when, and where can small growers get licensed. If socially equitable slash affordable for the average Vermonter. So, thank you, Stephen, and uh, Francis, and Ben for those public comments. Uh, you can see the link there. If uh, for those of you uh, watching in Vermont that want to submit your feelings and views about the about the process of the social equity subcommittee, please let your voice be heard. And with that, I will turn this over to Gina for this week's presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Jeffrey, for that wonderful introduction, and uh, thank you for our public comments. Um, we. Staff last week at representatives with the Cannabis Social Equity Board. I know we have been going back and forth on this for three, the last three meetings, well, last two meetings, and this will be our third meeting about this. Uh, we're taking into consideration a lot of it is, you know, obviously we want to make sure that all of these people will be drawn from diverse backgrounds and geographical locations in order to represent the interests of communities of colors and other marginalized groups throughout the state of Vermont. Last week, we were discussing about social equity cannabis representatives 
I know Ashley, you stated that if we were going to have a retail processor or cultivator, uh, and cultivator at that time, what you wanted delivery to be included, and then we didn't want to add more people, and then we also spoke about having a social equity candidate that has gotten a job in the cannabis industry as a representative, as our social equity program is not only to help license social equity, but also other social equity candidates who are looking for a career in the cannabis industry. So the changes that were made here is that we included, instead of just having it in every single part of the sector, we changed that to a licensed social equity cannabis representative from one of the following sectors. So from retail, processor, or a cultivator, and it would just be one person representing those sectors. Um, and then a licensed social equity cannabis representative from the delivery or cooperative, since those are special unique licenses for this group only at that time. And then putting in a social equity candidate currently working in the cannabis industry. Um, so Nader, I know that you were not on last week's call, so I'm going to, on Monday's call, um, so I'm going to start off with you. And then the business owner from disproportionately impacted communities, um, there's just a question about do we want them residing or just serving that community? I know we didn't discuss that last week, so it's highlighted in red, so to make sure we discussed it today. So Nada, can you start us off? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I missed you all. Sorry, I wasn't here at the last meeting. Um, so, you know, some of my thoughts, you know, I'm, I'm happy that we have a strong presence of social equity uh, people on this board, potentially. Um, one of my concerns is, you know, if we're, if we end up making this board bigger, um, I think that the more people you put into this, the slower the process will be. And one of our, one of the many concerns that we've talked about in the past is making this um, a faster process w without losing quality, but a faster process and prioritizing social equity applicants um, earlier on. So, you know, I just want to try to minimize the amount of lengthy bureaucracy that we create. So I, I think we're at 15. Are we at 15 or 13 right now? Was there change on the last name? Um, 15. We're at 15. Um, yeah, so those are my initial thoughts. And also, you know, with what's highlighted the business owner from a disproportionately impacted community, um, you know, my thoughts on that, I couldn't really think, well, I mean, my, my initial thought is that it could be a business owner who is either residing or serving. I don't have an opinion strongly one way or the other as to whether or not they have to be uh, just residing or just serving um, exclusively uh, in one of those categories for that community. So, um, so yeah, those, those are my initial thoughts. Thank you, Nader. Um, Ashley? your thoughts with it, these updates? Yeah, I think these are great. And I'm with, um, with Nader, like I'm not quite sure, you know, having them exclusively residing or exclusively serving. Um, I like that additional compliment. So yeah, I mean, I think this is good. I, I'm interested, you know, I understand how our subcommittee is working and how the board is working. Um, I don't know if anybody can speak to being on boards that have this many people on them typically. And I know we've talked about you know wanting to get through some of these issues quickly. So I don't want the numbers to be the hot button issue. I felt like that the last two meetings that's kind of what it's been about. And I just kind of want to put it to the group if, if this is a good amount or is it too many, not enough? And um, are we making sure that we're not leaving anybody out too? Um, and if we're not sort of like doubling up in certain areas, that would give a similar perspective. And great points, Ashley. 
Um, I'm going to hold off on talking about the number of panelists for now and kind of have that as another round discussion. Um, and one thing that you mentioned is if we might be missing someone. You know, we can bring in experts if we need more guidance, if there is someone that we feel isn't representing, um, represented in, the, in this board. Um, Julio, your thoughts? Um, I think uh, Nader made a good point about whether, you know, having ex being eligible if you either live or reside uh, in the community, the affected community, um, because uh, there'll be an application process, presumably, and I, I, I would take it that the Canvas Control Board can make the, the, the appropriate distinction so if someone you know owns a franchise operation but that uh, owner you know uh, resides in Montreal or Vancouver um, you know but has a franchise outlet here that might not be the suitable uh, candidate versus another candidate so I, I think opening it up to either um, it, it's fine Great, thank you. And how do you feel about the number of candidates? I, I think it's fine. Uh, you know, a couple of days ago, I and also Susanna uh, participated in a meeting of a different Vermont council, which has 23 members um, on it. Um, and uh, so I think it, relative to that, uh, 15 is, is uh, workable, I think. 17 is probably uh, more than, than I'm comfortable with, but I think 15 is, is good, especially as the list is developed, we have an increased uh, voice from, um, you know, folks in the community. That's where I, th I think we were all really striving to do that and balancing that against having uh, folks on the board who are, you know, who may have technical knowledge. So. I think 15 is the fine number. Thank you. Susanna, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I, I think 15 is really an upper limit of, of what I would recommend. But um, yeah, I, I think it's like that with it. Are you OK? Do you feel that all the people we want represented on the board are, are there? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, again, this is not the exhaustive list of everyone who can um, participate in the board's discussions. And I think that's, that's the important piece here. Great. Thank you. And so, Ashley, we're going into numbers. How do you feel about that number? Because I know that you just spoke about that. Are you okay with 15? I think I just wanted to put it more out in the world of making sure that we feel that everybody that we think should be there is there, and if not, I just, I, I'm not married to the number. Um, many of you serve, probably serve on other boards that maybe understand it a little bit better than I do, so I'm okay with the number if the consensus of the group is okay with the number. Okay, great. And, you know, also, I mean, for a quorum, it would need eight people, so it allows for, you know, some people to be able to be absent with that large of a number. Um, and Nader, how do you feel about 15 representatives? We're fine with 15. Okay, wonderful. So I think we're up to voting time. So Ashley, um, yes or no to this recommendation to the Vermont Cannabis Control Board for representatives um, for the Cannabis Social Equity Board? Yes. Thank you. Nader? Yes. Thanks. And Julio? Yes. Wonderful. Please note for the record that those are three yeses to the representatives for the Cannabis Social Equity Board. And you have all done a wonderful job with all different perspectives. I mean, this was very well thought out and planned to ensure um, you know, that social equity especially have a huge voice in this process. So thank you, and I am sure the public thanks you as well for that.
So now we get to our next agenda item, which is consider reinvestment of cannabis tax revenue into the cannabis disproportionately impacted communities. I know we've spoken many times about giving back to the communities that were burdened. I am making a recommendation of 20% of cannabis tax revenues to this fund, and the fund should be in support of education, legal aid, youth development, violence prevention. I know that uh, there were some public comments raised about land and housing access. I'm not really sure how um, and in, in what ways um, that would be addressed as well. And then after that, talking about what are some of these disproportionately impacted communities. Um, so Julio, can I get your thoughts on 20% of cannabis tax revenues going to this fund um, and what you feel the resources should go towards? Um, as we, I think the second time we've talked about this issue, I think we're all facing a little bit of the challenge of not knowing what the estimated revenues are. Do we have anything updated there you can speak to, or are we just going in for, again, as an abstract? This is just as an abstract number. Okay. So, um, and the whole idea of reinvesting into the disproportionately impacted areas on cannabis is to get to the root cause of the issue. You know, creating the social equity program will help the few that decide to join. But we want to help as many people as possible. And we can only do that by reinvesting and giving yeah. the resources that these communities need to help them to get to the next level as well. And as the industry grows, the amount of money going to them will grow as well. But I don't know, Julie, if you have any um, proposed numbers that you can share? Um, we do. I don't. They're on the computer that's serving as a camera right now, so I can't access them. They are on our website, I believe, with some of the market structure slides. Jeffrey, if you can just look into that for us while we're having this discussion, that would be great. Are you okay with the abstract 20% and um, it going to education, legal aid, youth development, and violence prevention? Uh, you're asking me. I think the um, I think the areas where um, there's investment. Um, I think are, are I think are good. Um, I think that I mean what I would like to be able to see is that there are um, grants for um, that 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 there's fund that is you know that would allow for. Uh, grant development that might change from year to year depending upon what the communities need um, so it's not confined because I, I could see that there there might be grants for a community that uh, may not fit neatly within these categories but might be might fit into broader categories and, and what I'm thinking about are um, some communities might need or, or could benefit from bridge or micro loans for transportation and accessibility issues where it may be that the state of Vermont is going to do long-term investments in public trans public transit or pool transit, but then there might the community might identify immediate um, immediate pro you know immediate needs that uh, the fund might be able to uh, provide that, that stopgap. So some things that would be uh, a little broader and that I think would be, that would have a basis for having, um, uh, you know, grant programs where, they, where people can, the community might put out or, or submit or have the 
proposed to the SEB board that they put out a request for proposals to provide X or Y services, uh, and then that, that there would be a grant that might be a few, two to three year grant program for that. Um, because I do think there are, I think we can't know ahead of time what all the areas are. So the, as this is kind of a start uh, of a list, I think it, it's fine. And it may be, when you're talking about that impact of communities fund, that might be a subset of what is in the fund, that it's a grant, that it could be a grant program for uh, for different either entrepreneurs or, or nonprofits. Okay. Um, I so the first, um, very great point, Julio. So the first point that I'm hearing is a um, grant program for applications for community development and or community needs. Is that correct? Am I, am I hearing that correctly? Yeah. yeah. And then the second one you said about entrepreneurs in that area, is that correct? or nonprofits for that community? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Okay. Um, Gina, I did I did yeah. find it on our website. So the 2022 projection for retail sales for finished products is, is around $10 million. That's just the first year. And then it goes up to about $103 million uh, in 2023. And that's just kind of its tax revenue? Well, that's the retail sales. So it's not necessarily a tax projection, but that's, so you would assume that, well, actually, I'm not sure if this is, is retail sales and tax, but the tax would be, I think, above that, or 20% yeah. of, you know. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Nada, your thoughts? Uh, one question I had is, what does the education category, what is that covering exactly like? What type of education? Well, I think that that would be sort of up to sort of the schools to develop if they need maybe, you know, earlier access or after school programs or um, new books or technology for that school that is necessary in those communities or maybe a laptop. Um, a program, you know, that if there was something that was specific educational wise due to the community needs, um, that they would be able to apply for funding on that. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, and or I even support. maybe sub helpers or, you know, whatever, you know, the education that isn't currently being funded but what would be beneficial to this group. Right. Yeah, I, I support the uh, four categories that we have listed there um, for the 20%. And um, what about um, the additional two that Julio mentioned, which is um, a grant program that a, a community can submit a proposal for a community need or development um, that may not be listed here, but can be reviewed for approval? I think that I think that's a good idea if it's an option that's available and that, or to make it an option available for town um, to address something that's not covered. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. And how do you feel about entrepreneurs or um, nonprofits um, that are residing or, or from those um, communities to be able to gain access to this account? I, I think that is something that would be more, I think there's a lot more discussion to be had on that. Um, have access to this account to do things like youth development and providing legal aid, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, um, I, Julio just mentioned it in an abstract um, way where if someone wanted to as an independent person to go into that um, but I do like what you're pointing out which is you know anyone who 
find help with legal aid or youth development or even violence prevention or education can submit for a grant for those instead of specifically having it as an entrepreneur or as a nonprofit. Um, I, I think that's also something that should go through the town as well, um, just to make sure that people, uh, that the voters would be in support of it as well. Yeah, I just always have a concern in the back of my mind of some other entity trying to exploit um, this sort of fund uh, for their own coffers. Um, so I think that if it goes to the town to make sure that voters are aware of who is trying to get a grant, um, I think that could be a good preventative measure to avoid any exploitation or anything like that. Yeah, very good concern. Ashley. Uh, Julio can go ahead. I saw that his hand went up. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to follow up on Nader's excellent point. I, I mean, what I had in mind in terms of a, a grant program is that these would be public competitive grants where every applicant has to be able to demonstrate the need and the ability to deliver that. I would think that the grant approval process would necessarily indicate that they'd be permitted and supported by the community and, and, and provide an opportunity for the community to either provide support or opposition or a competitive bid if the, if the community government uh, thinks that they are somewhat or an existing contractor can do it better. Um, there are just, I mean, the reason I, I, I would like that flexibility is that there are just a number of subject matters that aren't addressed here that could be addressed. Um, like I think Oregon allocates some of their funding to mental health services. Uh, Washington State, I think, has a certain percent that's set aside for, um, you know, like emergency uh, funding for people who have who are you know, have catastrophic uh, health care uh, costs that they're facing. Uh, and I'm not sure what Vermont would do. And so, uh, and those might be two, with the, you know, legislature or the CCB might think that those two on their own are, are good. Um, I, I just like the idea of leaving it open so that the more local, I mean, um, and, and really very, um, uh, folks can, uh, you know, make their own proposal or response to a request for a proposal because I think that, uh, you know, it, it, it's more flexible. And again, if you're doing it through, you know, open an open contract or, or RP process, then um, I think there's transparency and also, uh, you know, there'll be opportunities for uh, people to Put the, I mean, what I see for those small grants is that some entities, may, if they want to propose to do something, they may team up with another group that carries and brings in another set of in skills, and then they put in together a joint proposal to deliver some services that, again, maybe uh, maybe the, the local government, the state government, isn't quite quick enough or, or nimble enough to, to address it in the short term. So. That's the reason. That's the reasoning behind it to give that local feedback and flexibility. Leo, well, I really like the addition of just saying community grants based on their needs and or for development purposes. So then, if a um, need for the community was counseling or um, you know assistance with medical coverage, it kind of just they could apply towards just, you know, community needs. Um, so I really, I really like that addition, Leo. Okay. Ashley? I think I remember seeing a slide of some of the designated communities. Is that, can you? Um, so that's the next slide that we're just going to talk about. And these are, these are just at wanting to get people's perspectives right now on you know, are these the communities we want to target? Um, are there other communities we want to include in there? Do we want to take some of these off? So none of these are set in stone. Um, and, but 
something to discuss. So these are the, you know, maybe we just add a, a counseling and counseling as uh, and its own group here, um, or we just sort of put that into the grant perspective of the the community that says, you know, counseling is really important. Uh, medical assistance is really important, etc. Um, you know, with that community grant for development or need, you know, it really encompasses um, so much involvement um, and, and the, the flexibility of the community to really determine what their own needs are. I don't have much more to add than the other two really great points um, about this program. I mean, I too share in not wanting this program to be abused. I think there's potentially going to be lots of money in there. And when, when there's a lot of money, it, we all know what happens. So uh, that's why I was a little bit more concerned about which what we're going to designate as disproportionately impacted communities. I know this was a concern as far as what would qualify somebody for an SE applicant. And there was a worry of people moving to certain communities so that they could access um, applications ahead of time. And so I just don't see that happening in this situation. I mean, I, I'd like to, you know, this huge, you know, housing crisis, homelessness. I mean, obviously, you know, the grants that we're talking about here hypothetically, that could fit really well in there. But um, yeah, I just, I really hope we can do the most good that there, there will potentially be a fair amount of money to, to go around, especially if you're doing 20% tax revenue. I mean, that's, that's going to be a lot. Yeah. Good. Um, and this would be for the community itself. It wouldn't be directed to an individual. I mean, the community could potentially give a grant to an individual based for medical need. Um, but this is really to help all and not just a, a few. Um, so I think the risk of people moving can decrease in, in those aspects um, versus if it was just an individual person um, and then they could reply, then that might create a different um, forecast of, of movement. But it's a very good point that you bring up, Ashley. Susanna, your thoughts? Yeah, I I never I know that there's been some activity in the chat about whether we're talking about projected sales or, or tax revenue. Did we get the answer? Um, I know I heard the the scale of the first year by like what would it be on the first year and then a hundred and some odd million by twenty three. I don't know if we were able to get what the tax revenue would be out of that. And it almost It almost doesn't even matter. I guess what I'm what I'm just thinking about is 20% um, feels like a nice round number, um, and I just want to make sure that we're not anchoring ourselves with a nice round number. If if there's more that we could be considering in this program, so that was not an element. Whether grants go directly to individuals or to the communities themselves. I, I agree that um, to reduce the risk of people strategically relocating, then it makes sense to, to give grants to communities. I also wonder, I mean, I think of, when I hear from communities around the state, a lot of times what I'm told is it's the same handful of people who've been in power for decades, and they run everything, and if they don't like you, then you're out of luck. And I just wonder, have we thought about a mechanism for making sure that this just decisions are getting made objectively and fairly through a review process. I'm not sure how that gets thought out. And then in terms of the types of things to fund that we're looking at on this list, I, I like it and I would really like us to take an expansive view of what quote unquote education could mean. And um, because training and education takes many forms and sometimes we legitimize certain formal uh, tracks without acknowledging other ways that people um, gain expertise and what else? Legal aid, development, yeah. 
Thank you, Susanna. What do you think about um, how much do you think should be given back to um, these funds? Because there are, you know, the cannabis tax revenue funds are are being used in other ways in other places as well. And um, we've already requested 5% of can cannabis tax revenue to support the social equity program as well. Then there was 20% here. I believe that there was another 7% of marketing, 30% to another group, and seven of that percent was going to like marketing and educating about cannabis. Um, so, right. yeah. Gina, are you talking about the tax? So the um, on top of sales, there's a 6% sales tax, and then there's a 14% excise tax. So the 6% sales tax is to go to after school, and then 30% of that 14% excise tax is to go to prevention programs. And so that leaves 70% of the excise tax presently unspoken for or going into general fund. And so this 20% then, would that be coming out of the excise tax or that all? Um, it would have to come from the excise tax. So that, okay. okay. And then another 5%, which we've made a recommendation of. Yeah. So 25%. Maybe that, maybe that is right. Maybe that's comfortable. I don't know. I need, don't look at me, I'm thinking. And you know, all of this is what we're what we're saying to the cannabis, you know, board is to have them relook and reassess this, you know, like every six months or every year to really make that determination. Because now we're just dealing with abstract numbers and even the numbers that we're predicting may may not be true at all. Um, you know, as always, we have to just continuously reevaluate and ensure that what we're, our end goal is really being accomplished. Yeah, um, and I think one of the things that I'm struggling with, one is that it is very abstract, but the other thing is that it, it's scale, right? I mean, we want to go with recommendations that feel safe and likely, but we also want to be able to, to push as much as we can. And, you know, has Vermont historically been the number one offender in the United, the number one, you know, culprit in the United States for perpetuating the war on drugs against historically marginalized people? Probably not. But can Vermont afford to do more to make it right? Maybe. And if that's the case, then, so I, I think I'm just kind of wrestling with that is like the, the scale of it and not just, not just what's the minimum that we can do to say we've done a good thing, but what, um, what is the maximum that we can do? So, um, yeah, great point, Um I saw Jeffrey, you had your hand raised. Yeah, Ju uh, Julie and I are on the same wavelength, so she already, she addressed what I was gonna bring up. Um, and the numbers that Julie uh, mentioned earlier, that was based on overall sales production. Um, so it seems like, you know, in, in 2022, you know, it's probably be, the exercise tax would be less than $2 million and then we're asking for 20% of that. And then obviously it'll increase, um, in, in further years, but that is just a projection, you know. Um, we really have to see this take off and, and, and see what happens later down the road. Um, landing and housing access, I know that there was a mention of this um, in public comments. Do you, you know, do we want to add this to potentially um, for communities, and if so, you know, how would we go about that? Nada, your, your thoughts? Um, or, or do we just exclude it, uh, you know, and just make sure that this just goes to all of that and, and if the community needed to purchase something, they would put it in its grant request? So, I mean, I, I have a 
couple different thoughts you know, when it comes to land and housing access. Um, kind of going off of what you're saying, um, you know, having this potentially be in the grant if there is a need, I think that could be good. Um, I don't want, the one thing I worry about is spreading out the money so much that it has a very negligible effect in other areas, such as education and violence prevention and so on. Um, so, you know, if there's an identifiable need for land and housing access, um, and the community wants to develop a grant or a nonprofit wants to develop a grant for it, I think that could be a good idea. Right. And so have that under the grant category that it, um, the community grant need or development purposes, correct? Yes. Thanks. Ashley? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we've covered it. I, I don't know that I have much more to, um, to add. These are all really awesome perspectives and additions. Uh, if there is land, sorry, are you okay with um, us just putting any land or housing access needs um, that that goes under the grant need and development request? Yes. Great. Thanks. And Julio? Yes, but well, what's the question that you're asking me to comment on? Okay. Um, are you okay with um, under the community grant development or needs that if any land or house, a housing access was needed that they can just submit that to the board instead of having it at its own subcategory? Uh, I don't, yeah, I think that um, I think as far as the subcategory on its own, I, I just note that in the last legislative session, there were two bills to address expressly the issue of uh, increased access uh, to land and housing. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical about using rulemaking as a way of achieving things that did not go through the legislature and I think maybe taken back up in the legislature in the next session. Um, what, what I had envisioned when you, if you're just saying someone wants to apply for a grant uh, and, and they have a proposed um, uh, use for housing, um, I, was, I was kind of thinking that, uh, that they would be, if, if the board were thought that that, you know, based on its research of the input it received, that that was a subject, um, then the board would put it out for a competitive bid, because um, there may be other people who could deliver the same result uh, in uh, a more equitable way, a more efficient way. Um, so I don't, I, I, I think if you leave just community-based grants or that language you have, uh, I don't think it excludes housing. Um, yeah. Like I said, I don't, I, I'm a little skeptical that um, it would be, I mean, I read the, um, the coalition document, uh, which basically has a lot of detail uh, that resembles some of the detail in the proposed legislation, and uh, I, I would, I wouldn't rule it out. I would, I would put it in that grant subcategory, okay. but I don't know that we need to specifically mention it um, because I agree. Uh, um, but I, I agree. I wouldn't. I wouldn't exclude it. But for for you and for Jeffrey's sake, who haven't been in Vermont last year in the legislative session, like this is an active topic, uh, uh, and there's there's a lot more voices who are being heard on that than than our subcommittee or even the CCB. So. I don't want I don't want folks to think that we would be using this process as a way of necessarily um, closing those circles with that broader that that's going on in the legislature. I appreciate that for you, Beth Julio. Um, so I'd like to vote on this proposal um, recommendation of reinvestment of cannabis funds to disproportionately impact the community that there be a cannabis disproportionately impacted community fund created. 
um, allocation of 20% of Canada's tax revenue goes to that fund. Um, funds are used for purposes of education, legal aid, youth development, violence prevention, um, and community grants for needs and development of the communities that will be submitted to the board for approval, which can be in any category, um, no, open category there. Another, um, have you vote? No, I'll vote yes. Okay, thank you. Ashley? I'll vote yes. And Julio? Um, like Susanna, I, I, I'm not sure 20% is the right number. I don't think it's too much. Um, but with the expectation that the forthcoming social equity board would be in a position to recognize increasing the number uh, as, as people identify the needs with a little more uh, input from the community, I'll, I'll vote yes. We can put in a criteria that this be re-examined on an annual basis to ensure that it is meeting um, the needs of the communities and then possibly vote for increases or recommend an increase. Would you like that caveat put in, Julio? Yeah, I mean, I would like to say at least 20% with revisiting for increasing. I'm a little concerned that annual review would be what might be become a vehicle for scaling back and I think given the whole nature of the economy that that's being built here I, I wouldn't want to see it go below 20 percent okay at least one I would like one way I would like ratcheting one way per percentage okay uh, so at least 20 percent of cannabis tax revenue to the fund with annual um, review. Susanna, do you, you have your hand raised? I do, thank you. I, I like that suggestion and what I might add is that if we were to make that recommendation that somewhere, and again we're not writing you know, a statute here, but that we would uh, include some language that says what that review, how that review should be conducted or what it should entail, like what kinds of data and metrics will the reviewers need to be using to determine whether it's serving the community because it's kind of depending on who's reviewing it, they may not be in touch with the community needs. So maybe that means like looking at the acquainted population level outcomes or, you know, working with the chief performance officer to look at metrics or, or something like that. So we don't have to deal with that now, but just food for thought about how that process may be strengthened. Um, so you said Act 164? Act 186, and I will send you that will send it to you. Okay, or, I mean, I, I will consult with the Cannabis Control Board just to see if, if we're allowed to be that detailed, um, but that we sh there should be some protocol that is followed. Um, thank you for that, Susanna. The, that was an important caveat there. Um, so Julio, just want to make sure that we are voting on this where at least allocating 20% of tax, cannabis tax revenue to be determined later on, on an annual basis if there is a need for an increase. Yeah. Annual review. Yeah. Okay. Ashley, are you a yes to that addition? Yes. And Nader? Yes. Wonderful. So three yeses with the addition of at least uh, allocating a 20% of tax, cannabis tax revenue to the fund. Okay, wonderful. And it is public comment time. Are, and is there anybody in the room to make public comment? Like to speak. That's right. Take turns. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, I think we have two public comments. Thank you. Hi everybody, it's Ben. Thank you uh, for all of your work today. This was great to see you all just cruise through this. And also, you know, that public comment of mine was the one from, from weeks ago. So just thank you for still um, sharing it. Um, just to put some context, as I was doing some back of the pad math, 
um, around what you all just approved. It's a great amount of money for communities. Um, if we just keep the rounded number at the 10 to 100 million in retail sales, um, the 20% of the 14% excise tax comes to 280,000 on the low end and 2.8 million on the high end. And if the excise tax, which I believe is applied to wholesaling as well, I think it's at every stage of the market. Yeah, I, I believe it's at every stage of the market, which only is worth mentioning because if it is, that brings you up to 420,000 to 4.2 million, which is just ironic and great. Um, but that's a, a huge amount of money for communities. Um, and so just to reflect a little bit of public opinion that we have been hearing in our conversations, when the public hears about these allotments of tax, um, when they when it doesn't add up to 100, often we're hearing, well, why can't they just lower the tax um, instead of trying finding more places to put it? I think you know we hope to reflect your work in terms of this can continue to grow, we'll identify more needs. Um, one that we do hear about fairly often that I just would want to mention is environmental resiliency. Um, I don't know if there's plans at the general fund level or at the state level to address environmental resiliency throughout the state, but specifically in disproportionately impacted communities uh, that we know that there tends to be even less environmental justice, which in exchange is social justice. Uh, and that is it for me today. Thank you so much. And I'm going to hand things off to my business partner and friend, Craig Mitchell. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, and I know that the Vermont Cannabis Control Board has an IT issue, and that's why it was late, Ben. But we didn't want to make sure once we got it to, to have it on for public comment. I appreciate it. Thank you, Gina. Hello, everyone. My name is Craig Mitchell. It's my uh, very first in-person meeting. Oh, my god. Uh, but Ben has been, as you can tell, uh, a worthy um, stand-in for me and a business partner and, and someone who's been educating me on this stuff um, as I'm moving towards being a social equity applicant. Um, I appreciate all the language and all the hard work that you've been doing, but especially today, what really struck me, which I think is really important, is a focus uh, on mental health. And so bringing that back and circling back on that at some point would be wonderful as, as a way to discuss uh, the impact uh, as far as social equity applicants and, and how it's been impact, impacting communities, family-wise and otherwise. Uh, so again, thank you so much for your hard work and I look forward to, uh, to working with you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I think that's it for public comment, Gina. Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, so we are now going to discuss disproportionately impacted communities. And, you know, these are some of, I know, like high BIPOC ratio and high um, incarceration rates. Um, but let's just sort of look at these over and, you know, which ones do you think from this list should be here, should they not be here? Um, reorganizing what, what should we be adding? Julio, um, would you like to start us off? Um, it's Rotland, not Ruthland. Um, I'm sorry. That's okay. My apologies. Um, that's okay. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, you've hit the largest communities uh, in the state. I, I would, you know, I would have to look at some numbers really to get a sense um, in terms of, uh, uh, communities that might be disproportionately impacted. Um, a, a, a name that I'm, I'm not seeing here, but that shows up for me at least when I look at pub recent public health figures is, um, is Barry, B-A-R-R-E. Um, but I, you know, I don't, um, I feel like I don't have enough information really um, 
the ones I expected to see on the list, I guess, are here. Thank you, uh, Julio. I was just writing that down. Um, Nader. I think the names on this list are a good start. Um, and, you know, especially Rutland, you know, that one, from day one of when I was a cop, uh, Rutland was considered to be, you know, quote unquote, the hub of drug distribution. And, you know, that's, you know, if, if the location is considered an anecdote to be um, a hub, you know, you're going to have a lot of over policing in that area. Um, and so I'm, I'm just glad that Rutland's on the list. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I think the other towns also make sense. Um, as well as Bennington, you know, I've more recently heard a lot of different horror stories from people of color living in Bennington. Um, so I think the names on this list are good for that. Ashley? Yeah, I agree. These are these are all all the places I would expect. Um, but like Julio, I'd like to see a little bit more data. Um, I know like potentially Virgins have been on this list. I guess that's included in Orleans County. I need to look at my counties again. Isn't that terrible? As Vermonter. Um, and then in addition to that, my own county, you know, we we've, we've definitely maybe seen our own problems. So I didn't know if Memorial County was worth adding, maybe including so, but um, it potentially it, it's worth opening it up to a couple other counties. Yes, this is not, this is just an open conversation right now. So I don't want you to feel like we're trying to exclude, but really just understand and get a better definition of how, how we can kind of determine that. And uh, Susanna, please, what are your thoughts and questions on that? Thank you. Um, can you remind me, I'm embarrassed to ask, but can you remind me what is the impact that we are referencing again? Is it just impact of the war on drugs or disparities of all kinds? Just the impact on the war on drugs because this, um, which would be um, for our definition of BIPOC communities and communities that have high incarceration rates um, due to the war on cannabis. So then I might ask us to consider making sure that all of the border counties are present, or at least the border towns, because there's a lot of enforcement there um, with at least pretextual stop looking for drugs. And, you know, really it's just ice trying to round people up. And then along the same lines, I would consider areas that have larger farming communities, like um, the one in Franklin County, the ones that are south of Chittenden County, maybe Addison, because those also have larger migrant populations. And we find that if, if there are things like these and raids happening that are, again, pretext for drugs, then. Um, those are communities that are okay. It may not, and, and and I think also it matters um, where the community, the community where these things happen versus the community from which people come where these things happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I would like everyone to do in the next few days is, is some research along with me on really trying to ensure that we look into the disproportionately impacted community. So on those two references of, you know, large BIPOC community um, and also, you know, high incarceration or, or stop uh, arrest rates for cannabis. Um, we're also going to look on that. One of the things that, and I just, before we end, I just want to go back to the slide of reinvestment of cannabis funds. I know we sort of mentioned mental health, which we didn't list as um, as its own separate category. We did list it under sort of the grant available access. But because mental health is so important after 
you know, the trauma that people have suffered to the war on drugs, um, who would like to kind of just add that on its own separate category to really ensure that communities focus on getting people the care that they may need due to the trauma that they may have suffered? And Ashley, your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's an excellent addition. Thanks. Um, so would you vote yes to adding that on as its own separate category? Yes. Thank you. Julio? Uh, I think it's, it's fine, yes. Yeah. So is that a, a yes? I'm just getting yeses and no's for the record, sorry. I know. Yeah. Okay, but, okay thank you, Julio. And Nada? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so just adding to the record that we are going to add mental health as its own separate category for the disproportionately impacted community funds. And there were three yeses. Thank you so much. I think we've made really great progress. Uh, I'm happy that we are beyond the representatives and looking really into the communities um, that these funds are gonna go to. Um, and the many challenges that we are recognizing um, due to the prohibition of cannabis. So this is just a reminder for what we'll speak about on Monday is talking about these community groups. Please email me any information that you can help find based on that. And then we are going to start after that on our DEI program. You know, we spoke about this diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is was, you know, who have been historically unrepresented in society. You know, we want to allocate some resources to that as well. Um, so, you know, what sh should these groups be and what benefits do they receive? So everyone has this uh, PowerPoint presentation. I'll send it around again just to ensure that everybody is up to date with some of the changes that we've made. But please think about this so um, we can really start well next week. And once again, next month in November, we will be having phase two of our social equity program. So that is all for the public to come out, join us. Um, we will be there. NACD will be there in person um, at town hall meetings. And we're also are trying to have a virtual aspect of it as well so we can join hear your voices, hear your ideas of how the social equity program is going to go. Um, we cannot create a social equity program without everyone's involvement. So that is phase two for social equity, and then phase three will be the Vermont Cannabis Control Board, getting all of the recommendations from everyone um, and hearing everybody's voice to make their final determination. So I thank you so much, and you know, please reach out to us um, so we can start having conversations about this. Can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion to adjourn. Thank you, can I have a second? Julio Nader? I, I can't let go. <laughs> um, I know, it's too much fun social equity. We really are changing people's lives. You should feel so good after these meetings. I'm so pumped for the rest of the day, <laughs> knowing we're making a difference in people's lives. Reluctantly, I'll second the motion. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm also very sad to go, but <laughs> don't worry, next week is going to be even more fun as we expand on this and try to help as many people as possible. So thank you for being with us. Truly appreciate everyone out there and appreciate all the public comments that we get into. We cannot do this without you. Thank you.